So good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, invitation. Thanks to the organizers. It's a particular uh, pleasure to be amongst uh, uh, amongst you all. My name is Chris Pilotopoulos. Uh, I work for ECOS, which is an association of environmental NGOs um, uh, representing them in standardization processes and in eco-design regulatory processes. Um, so I'm pleased to be amongst uh, uh, academics and researchers in particular. I'm, I'm, I'm neither. Uh, so uh, in order for me to feel a little bit better and cozy up with the evidence-based approach that uh, EC3Police is committed to, here's a little bit of uh, science or facts, if you like. So I'm not sure how, how much you, you can see that back there, but it's, it's basically a demonstration of the uh, Arctic ice coverage uh, uh, which reached a record low in 2016, if I'm not mistaken, since the time measurements began. Uh, but of course we're in Brussels as well, so I'm going to quickly switch back to politics. Uh, th this is obviously the signing of the Paris uh, Agreement. So I guess, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that we are in a bizarre and magical situation in 2018 where uh, both science and politics are backing us to do the same thing. Um, so basically one needs a very strong microscope to go from that into eco-design and then into test methods uh, that I have been asked to touch upon today. Uh, but I guess test methods um, are equally important. They, they fulfill, let's say, they, they are associated uh, with the classic trinity of benefits that we see for the regulatory part as well. So test standards really influence how much energy savings we find uh, in, 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 we have in practice. They influence consumer decision because they determine in the end the class uh, and the information that goes on the label. And of course, they influence industry competitiveness. Now, test methods have enjoyed um, prominence and media prominence in particular uh, the, the, the last year and, and actually for the wrong reasons. Uh, I, I always like to uh, uh, portray this, uh, this uh, slide here from, from our uh, members transport and environment, which kind of shows the different, um, uh, let's say, alterations and the different changes that take place uh, for the testing of uh, uh, car emissions. So you would see the, the use of special uh, tires, the use of special lubricants, the, the full optimization of the, of the conditions in the test, etc. Um, but that is still not far away from our sector uh, in, in eco-design. Uh, we've uh, started to, to observe already some years ago uh, how, well, started to question how representative the test methods are, how much they reflect reality and energy savings on the field. Um, so one example is the, the fact that products come in different operating modes. So you have these eco modes, these comfort modes, uh, different products and functions, which are not always captured in the test. In some examples, they are quite at a prominent stage for washing machines, for dishwashers. We discussed this extensively. For other products, much less, such as in the case for, for heaters, which for some years, the, the, there isn't really a specific method or specification uh, in the uh, regulation or in the standard of which mode should they be tested in. Uh, so that leaves a question open again on whether, uh, under which condition does it comply what kind of class would it get in different modes, etc. And of course, the uh, discussion that also occupied the media was the, the uh, case which, which was even uh, uh, legal, the case of, of vacuum cleaners, where uh, uh, I guess the lesson learned here was, was uh, how representative a method without uh, dust bag, or, or actually with, with an empty dust bag uh, instead of a, a partly filled dust bag uh, is considering that as the dust bag of the vacuum cleaner uh, fills with dust, its performance changes. So these were, these were examples, these were how test methods made it into media prominence, if you like. Uh, but of course, there's a challenge. Uh, uh, there's, there's several criteria, there's several uh, tick boxes that test methods we use for eco-design and energy labeling have to tick before they are appropriate to, to support the regulatory framework. Of course, uh, one needs to be able to 
repeat the test several times and get similar results. Otherwise, you lose the uh, uh, necessary concept of comparability between products. Uh, the concept of reproducibility is something very similar, uh, meaning you can test the, you, you would expect to have similar, very close results, no matter where, in which laboratory and which facility you test the same product. Um, so quite important concepts. Uh, also affordability, uh, some people refer to it as, as cost. Um, I prefer the term affordability myself. It's, uh, it's one of the main arguments uh, uh, when, when we have these debates and, 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 uh, and thinking processes about the test methods that, uh, of course, the added cost is, might be unbearable and we already have resource issues, etc. Uh, but I, I'm always tempted to think that um, it, it's not really added cost. It, we're talking about transferring cost. It's a matter of who pays and when it is paid, because one could very well argue that uh, one euro that is saved from a, a cheaper uh, methodology, a methodology which is more optimized uh, and less realistic, this euro might be lost in the future uh, um, uh, energy savings that are put on the field compared with what we expected to have by the regulation. And finally, of course, we have representativeness, uh, which uh, using the examples that I mentioned earlier and, and the examples, some, some more examples that I will mention later, I would argue that it is the criterion which is equally important and probably most underrepresented or underconsidered in the current set of standards that we have. So this, this last criterion, let's say, is, the, is, is it opens a, a, a wider discussion uh, uh, on, on how much can we mirror reality. So another very popular argument or counter argument in, in, in the debates that we have is, uh, well, you can never mirror 100% consumer uh, be behavior. You can never mirror reality to, to the fullest uh, because you need to be able to have some optimization. You need to be able to um, uh, compare, be uh, have comparability between products. Uh, and it's true. I mean, it's, it's not appliances themselves that bring about energy savings. It's consumers that bring about the energy savings as well with the way they behave, the way they interact with the product and the way they maintain it even if we, if we go to the resource efficiency discussion as well. Um, but it goes both ways. There are, there are extreme sources, uh, the, the extreme ways of, of behaving on the field. Uh, I remember where, when we were in the, in the university, for example, you would have a television on nonstop, just playing in the background noise with full functionalities and, and, and all the energy uh, eating uh, functions on, or you would have, uh, you know, you would attempt to vacuum the, f the, the floor from the empty pizza boxes or whatever with a vacuum cleaner, behavior which is not really representative either of the average, the normal, the typical uh, consumer behavior that we are trying to, to capture. So we have seen some uh, response, some uh, feedback uh, to this, uh, to these discussions that we uh, we uh, initiated in the in the last years. There's a very uh, specific reference, uh, a couple of references actually, in the uh, energy labouring regulation of last year. Uh, well, I can't read it from here, and probably you can't either. But basically, um, in in uh, in a nutshell, uh, it it acknowledges. Uh, uh, the fact that test methods should, uh, let's say, reflect real life use as much as possible, take into account consumer behavior, um, uh, etc., both on, on the recital and, and, the, and the article of the regulation. Now, uh, besides the, the regulatory uh, side of things, we've, we've also had uh, uh, discussions uh, and initiatives at the standardization uh, level. Uh, it was uh, some time back that uh, uh, Rainer Stamminger from the University of Bonn, uh, Hans Paul Siderius, who, who spoke to us a little bit earlier, uh, and myself started thinking about ways and, and methods to kind of standardize the uh, assessment of these TEF methods to, to, to find out how representative they are. Um, so basically we thought about 
defining a method, defining a, a simple step approach on how you can do this, this assessment uh, and upgraded it to the standardization groups. Uh, so this is a, a methodology that is being discussed in uh, the context of uh, Senelec TC59X, the, one of the biggest committees in, in, in the Senelec and, uh, and it's being picked up by product specific groups, which is fantastic. Um, so what we did is we attempted to define consumer relevant product testing as the product testing that provides results that correspond. They're not exactly the same, but correspond to the results that you would find in the field at the consumer's uh, home. And it's probably the right moment to speak about the distinction, the differentiation between consumer relevance and how representative, how realistic a method is and circumvention. Uh, having having an agreed, established test method that everyone legitimately uses and bows to, uh, even having its weaknesses and its shortcomings is surely different than uh, attempting to bypass, to circumvent uh, the, the agreed and established methods to portray better results uh, and have better declarations. So that, in, in theory, we did something very simple. We followed two rules, uh, uh, listing all the parameters that influence energy consumption, and of course, all the parameters uh, that, uh, well, the performance aspects. So let's say a vacuum cleaner is not just meant to be energy efficient, it is meant to clean clothes. Uh, so so these, this kind of, th there's a conflict there that we always uh, uh, came up with uh, in our investigation. Once you list these parameters and these aspects, uh, you move to what's the second step, which is comparison. So we're, we, we investigated what is uh, in the test method, in the standard, what is assumed, what is uh, taken for granted, what values are used for each of these parameters, let's say ambient temperature or humidity for a fridge, whatever. Um, and then we compared it with the range of values and uh, parameters that we find in real life. Uh, we did the same for performance aspects, how they are assumed or how they are treated in a test method and then how they are experienced by the consumer in real life. And of then, of course, we do the, the um, assessment. Uh, you probably can't see that either, but basically that... <laughs> That's, uh, that, that's an example. Uh, we, we, we did three examples, by the way, refrigerators, uh, vacuum cleaners, and washing machines, wasn't it? Uh, so here you have the column with the, the parameters that, uh, that influence energy consumption, how we find them in the standard, how we find them in real life. This is, of course, not a point-to-point -point assessment. You, we have to use some critical thinking after that. It might as well be that every variation is not problematic. It m might as well be that the, the, a difference between what we see in the standard, in the test method, and what we see in real life is very much legitimate. It's, it's understandable. Uh, it's all about defining a level of acceptability. Uh, and probably don't have time to go through the product specific observations but things we observed uh, from from this study is that uh, uh, indeed in some cases we have a consideration of all the criteria that we uh, spoke about earlier and consensus and and uh, uh, um, uh, let's say sacrifices among them, uh, but in other cases it was indeed very uh, clear that repeatability and reproducibility were prioritized over representativeness and, and uh, let's say the standard being realistic. Now uh, when this happened uh, it was again either for legitimate reasons or there was an attempt to compensate this, this uh, variation or prioritization. A classic example is the lack of door openings in fridges, which was compensated by um, uh, the fact that you would test in a higher uh, average temperature compared to what you see in, in a European household. Um, so th this kind of modification then this kind of compromises we, we, we saw in the in the tests. Now, whether these compromises are, are uh, sufficient or not is a different discussion. Um, I have to give a shout out to my colleagues of the STEP project, uh, which was a project we ran in 2016 and 2017 uh, with CLASP, uh, uh, Europe, ECOS, obviously, EEB, and Top 10. 
uh, where we actually uh, did tests uh, again on three types, uh, three product groups, refrigerators, televisions and dishwashers. The report is already published. And uh, basically we use the test methods that are in the established uh, test, um, standards, European standards. And then we did uh, a little bit of change. We introduced some differences, some changes, um, uh, running different tests to be able to compare and see what happens to the product um, uh, aspects and performance, uh, let's say elements, when you make a little bit of change to the test. So we, Amongst many other things that we found, some example of lack of representativeness in the test was uh, uh, in the case of refrigerators, for example, the impact of door opening. Some, some of the appliances that we tested uh, showed even a 10% difference uh, uh, compared to having or, well, when we examined having or not having door openings. In the case of televisions, we examined what is the impact of what was an, an outdated uh, uh, test video loop with uh, not really representing what consumers see in real life with frequent uh, uh, cutscenes, etc. Uh, in dishwashers, we, uh, let's say, observed what was probably already known that we have so many different programs, so many different functions and their combinations, even up to 30 to 50 combinations in the market. Uh, and we are only testing in the official test method in one eco standard mode. So um, th these were the kind of examples that we, we, we observed in the um, consumer relevant testing, uh, in the uh, STEP project, I'm sorry. So moving uh, to recommendations, uh, obviously I have academics and researchers um, amongst, uh, amongst us. Consumer behavior studies, this is a call to you as well. This is, we, we, in order to address a problem, we still need to define it. There's still gaps in our understanding of how consumers use these products, especially with new features and elements that Hans Paul uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, so this is definitely an area which would really benefit uh, policy making, the preparatory uh, studies, etc. Um, a systematic consideration of consumer relevance and circumvention in uh, supporting eco design and uh, legislation for all products. Uh, this is what uh, I, I, I borrowed this, this title from, from Professor Alan Meyer, one of his presentations in the past, institutionalizing it. So uh, basically having uh, clauses, specific clauses in either the regulation, in the standardization requests of the European Commission to the standard bodies, and finally within the test methods on, on uh, uh, first of all, giving the political signal, and secondly, on smart ways, on cheap ways, if you like, uh, to, to address and to be aware uh, and alarmed of, of circumv potential circumvention or fix a lack of representativeness. Um, so I don't know how that ended up in the fourth bullet point, but it's probably one of the most important. Uh, and just to avoid a million questions after the presentation, yes, this means improvements in the market surveillance and enforcement system. It needs resources, it needs funding, it needs coordination, support, uh, information exchange, and a uh, established system of sanctions for such behavior. So this is this is indeed an area that, that, that needs to be looked into. And last but not least, uh, I'm going to go back to my step colleagues again. Explore new ways of testing. Uh, so we can, we can still have, uh, let's say, the optimized, the standardized, classic test method when we want to declare energy class, when we want to uh, uh, make our declarations on the different elements of the product, but in parallel, uh, without sacrificing this element of comparability that we need to preserve, we can run an additional test. We can uh, we can start fiddling with the uh, with the uh, uh, standardized uh, uh, methods, introducing little differences that may allow us to identify suspicious uh, uh, behavior. Having a door opening, uh, having a cutscene that is different. Uh, this would. Uh, indeed allow us to go a step beyond and, and, and see if something might be going wrong. And if, again, we attempt to institutionalize it, we might establish a variation cap saying, okay, we have the, the, the standardized method 
uh, that produces the label, produces the declared values, but w when you change something in the test method, the variation should not be dramatic, should not be excessive, because that might mean there's something wrong happening in the field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good work. A lot of info in short time, and we have uh, some minutes for questions. Hi there, uh, Daniel Hinchliff. Um, who do you think should bear the responsibility for um, carrying out these kind of tests? Should it be left to academia, or should it be something that's uh, included in the EU um, review studies, or is it something that Senelec should be doing themselves? I think it's a combination of, of actors and the different stakeholders that contribute to the policy making process, the preparatory studies. In, in Senelec, uh, indeed in the standard bodies, uh, the experts, when, when a new method is, is defined, uh, there's what we call, or there would ideally be a round robin test or verification procedure uh, for everything that, that changes. And, and then you would see the measurement uncertainties and the general uncertainty that might be associated with these changes. So in the standardizers uh, side, and that's why we are happy that, that the, the, the methodology for consumer relevant testing that, that uh, I spoke about briefly a little bit earlier is picking up, uh, let's say, interest in, in the various working groups. So they could be the ones that, that verify uh, these new elements that, uh, that that may be introduced. And of course, in the, in, in the preparatory study, again, uh, uh, feedback from academia and researchers uh, might be useful to see how far we can go, how to, how to combine those four elements of repeatability, reproducibility, and cost. Uh, it's, it's really in a, in a resource uh, scarce uh, area. We, we would be happy to get any feedback uh, we, we, we can. Uh, Carsten Schischke, Fraunhofer ISRM. Um, for some very good reasons, uh, test standards have been somewhat simplistic in, in, in the past, up, up to now. Now we re recommend to um, come closer to real use patterns uh, to more realistic results, which basically is good. Um, have you investigated somehow what uh, that might mean then for the testing costs at both ends, so for the manufacturers and also for the market surveillance authorities? Yep. Because for them th that is crucial already right now, wh what are the testing costs of uh, these devices? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I mean, that that's that's an area to investigate. That's definitely my my call to to uh, to to you as well. Uh, I mean, it, it it could be the case that there are smarter interventions that can take place. For example, when we run the tests for uh, fridges, you uh, 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 load the fridge for some tests. Uh, when you want to see the uh, refrigerator capacity, etc., but you don't fill in the fridge when you test for the energy consumption. I'm wondering how much extra cost would that have since you already have the, uh, I think they're called M boxes, when you already have means to load the fridge, when you already have the stuff that is performing the test, etc. Of course, there will be some more time uh, to run the test, etc. But th there could be low hanging fruit and uh, smarter ways to uh, introduce representativeness that is not done currently. Tim Cooper, Nottingham Trent University. Good to see you again, Chris, <laughs> after you. quite a while. Um, I'm interested in maybe bridging today's discussions and tomorrow's by asking you about um, the stage at which you do the tests. The assumption seems to be in the discussion so far, we're doing the tests at the start of the product's lifespan. Uh, our own work on vacuum cleaners, for example, shows that uh, consumer behavior over time has a real impact on, on that, particularly their uh, lack of maintenance procedures in that. I'm just wondering whether you've done any work or have considered uh, the implications of maybe doing tests after five years, which would um, bring into play necessarily how consumers act and use their appliances. Yeah, thank you very much. Another uh, another interesting question. Uh, uh, yes, we've started looking into uh, test methods and rather assessment uh, uh, methods uh, at this stage for resource efficiency concepts like durability, repairability of products, etc. And the added challenge there is that uh, you might not be able to, or there's more uncertainty associated with, uh, uh, let's say, assessing these concepts when the product is placed on the market, which is where 
that the eco design framework is based on. Uh, but uh, we have started these discussions in the context of, of the standardization mandate 543. The Commission have asked us to look at general, generic, non product specific assessment methods. And there we're trying to see how you can possibly establish a user profile for the product, again, making assumptions on how the consumer would use it uh, uh, across its, its, uh, its lifespan. But again, this is probably a discussion for tomorrow, but with, when it comes to resource efficiency, there are aspects that could be more easily regulated or more easily considered by policymakers. The availability of spare parts is something that comes quickly to mind uh, uh, without needing to run a test or without needing to, to do this expensive, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, process. But it's, it's, it, yeah, it, it's a difficult question. It's, it's an interesting area that we, again, uh, again have, to, have to look into. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a very good presentation. Thank you. And it's good to see you again. Good uh, to see you. You know, the, 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 um, there's an expression in almost every language that the, the devil hides in the details. And I think that uh, test procedures, energy test procedures, must be in the deepest, deepest depths of hell. But nevertheless, uh, it, it is actually an area which is going to become very exciting and much more complicated than in the past because there, there are many trends going on that that have been hinted upon by Chris and then also by uh, Hans Paul that mean that the way we've tested uh, appliances in the past and today will no longer be relevant. Some examples are uh, mobility of appliances. You, you are showing vacuum cleaners, but now most of the, the, the innovation in vacuum cleaners are mobile appliances. <laughs> And this is especially true in IT appliances. How do we test mobile appliances that operate very often uh, independently of the grid, but recharge themselves at various times? How do you, how do you measure their efi efficiency? How do you test appliances that have uh, DC power? Increasingly, we're going to see uh, more use of DC powered uh, appliances. None of these test procedures today capture DC appliances, yet that's going to be one of the the greatest areas of growth for uh, ICT products. How do you test usability of a product? We know that the behavior of the, of the user is important. So if an appliance is more usable and encourages more, uh, more efficient behavior, how does that get captured? And then finally, the, the network connection may become important because, of course, the testing uh, can change if the, the cloud uh, knows that an appliance is being tested, then it may have some special test mode. But at the same time, we need to recognize that that's an important uh, way of saving energy. So even though I suppose we, um, we, we, we are exploring the depths of hell in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in, this, in this topic of test procedures, I think there's some real opportunities here to, to, to make it exciting and, and, and make it part of the positive process rather than something that we sort of do as an afterthought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a reply or <laughs> say? <laughs> uh, uh, all these questions, I, I would take tomorrow's uh, schedule as well, but uh, yeah, open to the audience. Thank you, thank you very much. It's, it's these uh, functionalities, this kind of, uh, uh, especially in ICT products that we really need to, to think how, how to, to capture. We've, we've even have discussions about self-reporting uh, uh, devices and appliances and privacy discussions and, 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 uh, uh, and everything. So uh, definitely an exciting area for the future as well. Good. Thank you very much. Um, after going into the depths of hell, we can only go upwards, right? So can, can, can uh, I just, can I just, before Chris um, leave the stage? Uh, thank you. Chris Maputi here from South African Department of Energy. I just wanted to find out the the relationship between the the approach of having a representative test approach um, and the time it takes to complete a testing uh, or a testing of, of a particular appliance. I'm saying this because we we are sitting with a challenge where it takes longer to complete the testing of a specific appliance, and that creates a problem locally in South Africa because. You would find industry players now complaining that we are sitting waiting for test results and therefore we can't have 
certain documents that would have allowed us to sell our products. So I just want to find out what is the reasonable time it, w it should take for an appliance to be mm -hmm. tested and completed mm -hmm. in time. Thank you very much for the, for the question. Uh, indeed a good one, because in, in our criteria that, that you saw earlier, time uh, was kind of integrated or assumed to be within the affordability criterion. So it, it should probably uh, mean to represent resources in, in general. If you test in more than one program or function, of course, you would, you, it takes more time to test it. If uh, the, the, the more representative you make it, it might uh, uh, affect the time. But I, I, again, and, and the cost subsequently, but again, what we can start looking into or what we can exploit is the low hanging fruit. We do have, uh, uh, let's say, the equipment in some cases and some product groups. We do have the, the uh, uh, stuff there. Uh, we just, maybe for historical reasons or for different reasons or it wasn't in the test standard historically, we didn't make that leap of making uh, the energy efficiency standard more representative. So the indeed resources is something to always be considered, but uh, we still believe there's, th with the examples that we observed, there's still room for low hanging fruit and, and boxes that we can tick without in too much increased cost or, or testing time. Thank you very much. <coughs> yes, and um, from, monitoring health to uh, big data heaven, right? Uh, uh, that was Peter has some new <coughs> interesting stuff on market yeah. surveillance. But uh, I can't refrain to take some of the, my time to comment on the, what you just said, Chris, because one thing you just touched upon, which I thought you were going to say, the smart meter also means that you can actually, you can actually monitor consumer behavior. You can use that kind of data to learn much more about uh, uh, how people behave and how they use appliances. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and then another thing was regarding uh, uh, consumer behavior, but there was a consumer acceptance, like I'm doing a lot of lighting stuff, glare, for example, or color rendering. How do you test things like that? can be super technical, and people are not really aware of, so you have to check how to test things like that. And then finally, about the lifetime, some products claim to, to last for a very long time. How do you test them? How do you understand the behavior after 20,000 hours or even longer? <laughs> 